Um, I'm just going to go off of what we have in the uh, the shared notes. Um, yeah, sounds good. I don't have a whole lot to add, but um, maybe I can think. I'll think of something as we go through it. Um, but Did it seem like this chapter didn't go into the math as much, which I'm grateful for, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good. yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I, yeah, there were definitely. I I noticed a couple statements that said this but the details of how this works is beyond the scope of the book mm -hmm. um like maybe definitely more than once so yeah i don't know i didn't notice that it was too different than the rest of the book but um but uh yeah so anyway um but i i thought the chapter was pretty good um so so i guess we could get going um so yeah, so support vector machines. So in this chapter, we're only talking about um, kind of uh, one approach to classification. Um, all these are uh, basically different ways of developing a, like a decision boundary to um, classify something into one class or another, or um, as we'll see at the end or talk about the end, um, it can be extended to um, kind of many classes with the, using a couple different approaches. Um, and then as we go through, we'll basically go from uh, a version of this with this maximal margin classifier that is um, when the way they talk about is it's linear and very sensitive to points on the margin uh, or in the support vector. Um, and then as we go to the then we go to the end, we get to options that are that are nonlinear um, and um, uh, and sorry, and also a little bit more robust uh, to small changes in um, in the points on the margin or on the kind of in the border of uh, the decision boundary. So just that's just like kind of a high level um view and then yeah we'll go into each of these so yeah and I, yeah support vector machines uh was yeah kind of interesting an approach developed in 1990 um and uh yeah and there's a kind of a few different flavors that will um of, of this kind of approach that we'll talk about just trying to understand what this graphic is representing here. So we have the classifier. I guess this is support vector classify is kind of like the, I think they're saying it's the broader kind of bucket. And then these two are elements or, or examples, specific cases of the support vector classifier. Is that how you read it? Yeah. Okay, I just, I guess I would flip it, maybe. That's what uh, I thought, because we went, I don't know why, sometimes I get stuck on chronological things, but I thought that they covered support vector machines at the very end as like a catch-all sort of, but maybe mm -hmm. I'm wrong, so. Um, yeah, yeah, so like, I know support, I know that they can, a support vector machine, I think, can be written um, depending on the, what is it the different there's like a parameter as well as the like the power that you're raising um like the kernel to mm -hmm. i think if, if i think i think i think if that's one then it basically becomes the same as um a support vector classifier uh okay, maybe i need to but i box. will we need to look at it yeah or i'll, I'll yeah. look at it as we go through sorry sham were you gonna say something no, no, it's all right. It's OK. Oh, OK. All right, well, let's go to the, I think it would be good to go through you know, each of these concepts and see, um, yeah, if we still have questions as we get to them. Um, so, so yeah, so the, first in the book, they kind of go through this maximum margin classifier idea. And um, they talk about like a linear boundary. So. Um, in a 2D space, it's just a line. Um, so there's examples in the book, you know, where they show a scatter plot with 
you know, two different classes um, and a line that is separating them. Um, and yeah, and, and in higher dimensions, um, you know, this is generally just referred to as a hyperplane, um, which is essentially the same thing, just in, you know, higher dimensions as we see in the 2D space. Um, and you can represent it as a, um, you know, like a linear equation, linear combination of weights and um, across these different variables um, that you have in your data set. And, and yeah, and those make up, you know, define some kind of a boundary where above that line or hyperplane, you have one class predicted and below you have another. Um, Okay, so this is, I think, basically saying the same thing here. So you have some kind of data set with n time, n observations, p dimensions, two classes, negative one and one. When you have a new observation, you want to classify it into one or two groups. And depending on where it falls, either below or above this hyperplane, um, that's how you determine what uh, predictable class it's going to be in. Kevin, one, yeah. can you go back? This is just a, a... Yep. A dumb uh, like notation right question. Here. Right here. Just one back. Yeah. So when they say uh which is a vector x asterisk, right? Is equal mm -hmm. to those. That uh transpose is generally because a vector is written like vertically as opposed to horizontally. Like I, that's the notation. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, God. That makes so much sense. Cause I was like, wait, do you need to apply some sort of a transformation? But okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I, I think I think it's just um, honestly, I'm not really sure why they do that, but I'm guessing that yeah, like it it I don't know. It be, yeah, I think you might be right because the vector they want it to be you know uh, like vert written vertically or represented vertically. I don't, but they don't want to write it that way. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Because it, so it they, would just disrupt yeah the flow of the text. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Um, yeah, I was I noticed that too a bunch, and um, it definitely means transpose. Um, but uh -huh. um, I think that's probably why. Just a kind of a convention, just to, because it's in text. Um, but okay, yeah. that makes but sense. It, but it's interesting though because like this is a observation, right? So this is mm -hmm. actually a, a row in this n p matrix. You're right. So, yeah. So so it actually is like, you know, in the matrix, it's just like a table, right? It's just gonna be yeah. left to right and not transposed. But maybe yeah. when you plug it into, you know, I don't know, uh, when you're like maybe if you're doing matrix multiplication or something and like you need it to be a you know, like a vector. I don't know. Um uh huh, right. That's true. That's a good point. But maybe I, I'm not really sure why, but you know, uh, I think we're in the right ballpark. Okay. Just, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. Um, no, no problem. Thank you. Um, oh yeah. So this is a really good, you know, slide with the, um, you know, showing in the two dimensional case, this, um, this decision boundary in this case, you know, the hyperplane that's in two dimensions, which is just a line. Um, so in this case, they're really easily separable, right? So above and below, there's no mixing. Above and below this line, you know, you have two different classes. Um, yeah, and then so basically if the equation that you have here um, is, uh, you know, given a certain observation, you know, with x, um, x, p, right? So like a value for each predictor, um you'll get uh, a number here that's either below, above or below zero and if it's above zero in this case you're going to get it's going to predict like a y equals one class and below zero y equals negative one um you also have the point here that the magnitude of um of this i guess this function here um matters so if see i think they're saying if it's really far above the decision boundary so if it's above zero then um 
then it's then we're less confident um you know that about his class so i guess as you get closer to this line um you know it, it, you can think that i guess that you know this point here we might be less confident about than this one up over here Um, okay. Uh, any other questions here? No questions. That was a very good explanation. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. I don't, I, thanks. I, it's, um, I don't feel as good about the math as well. So, um, this week. No, actually, so. um, when you walk through, you know, the equation defining the hyperplane, that's where I had had some mm -hmm. questions, but the way that you described it, that helped me to really? understand. Okay. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. I think it's helping me too as I'm, as I'm talking through it. So. Awesome. Um, cool. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so this is interesting, right? So it's saying here, I remember this in the book too, that if you can create one hyperplane, right, you can make an infinite number of hyperplanes. So if you go back here, um, right, like you can make a line that's just below this. Um, and you, okay, and see all these lines here on the left, those are all lines that actually do perfectly separate those two classes. Um, so, and you can imagine an infinite number of lines you know, along here, right? Uh, you know, it's a continuous, two continuous scales. So there could be an infinite number of those lines that would still perfectly separate the two classes. So the question is, which one do you choose? Um, and the answer is, the, in this case, this maximum margin, maximum margin hyperplane, um, which is the one that's furthest from the training data. Um, so basically you look at each training observation and where your boundary is, where the hyperplane is. Um, and you want to find the weights, you know, in these betas um, that get you the furthest away, like on average from each point. Um, so, so it's called the maximal margin. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think that's basically the concept. So the yeah, the way that we way to determine is just what is going to maximize the distance between that line and uh, the training observations. All right. Okay. Um, read this here. Okay, so here they're just showing you the different um, these points. So the ones that are closest to um, uh, the bound, this hyperplane um, are the ones that, so the, this dotted line here, right? So in this case, I guess that they're saying this is the margin because this is how far you have to go until you hit a point, you know, away from the from this hyperplane, which is the line. In this case, um, and the points that are actually on this line that make up this boundary are called um, support vectors. Um, and so in this case, there's three training observations that are on the line on, the, on either side of the boundary. So one, two, and three. Um, and this hyperplane depends on these observations, but it doesn't depend on any of the other ones. So if this, mar this point over here moves over here, the the um, the hyperplane will not move uh, because uh, it's just trying to maximize the distance um, between these points that are the support vectors, the ones that are closest to this line. Makes sense. Any questions there? I I hadn't I didn't know that. I was when I I had taken a. It was in this boot camp I did the we talked about support vector machines and um, it never I really liked this explanation they gave about uh, the support vector like what that actually is um, support vectors I guess um, and and I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, my question is um, mm -hmm. do we have um, like a minimum number of support vectors that we need to have? that maximize the distance or we just choose randomly um, like 
any number of vectors, uh, support vectors. Yeah, so um, I think for this maximum margin classifier, it's, it doesn't, I don't think it has a minimum. Um, it's just gonna be the points that are, I think often it's, pro from this definition, it seems like I would be likely that it's often just gonna be two points, right? Because like, it, you know, if you have a continue values in a continuous space, like how likely is it that they'll, you know, oh, I, I would say often there won't be two points that have the same exact value um, on two dimensions. So I, I would say it's probably likely that a lot of the time in this maximum margin case, you just have two. Um, and I think that's fine. Like, it seems like that works for this approach, but I don't think that, but this isn't like a, so they really do are, are, are careful to distinguish between this maximum margins classifier and like support vector machine. These are all related, but they're not the same. And this is very kind of inflexible, I guess, compared to, you know, it's a linear boundary and also it's, um, it's very strict in terms of um, um, not allowing any points to be in the margin or any points to be on the other side of the boundary. Um, so um, and I, I don't think the, like my sense is that these, these early, what they're talking about with this support vector classifier, maximum margin classifier, I, I, I would guess they're not used very often because support vector machines are just so much more flexible and also uh, tolerant of slight, you know, uh, violations in the margin. Um, Same I a, uh, yeah, a question following up on what Sham just said. So um, I I don't know, wouldn't it sort of depend on the data set? Like if you have data sets that are, you know, I guess closer together or yeah. some that are very far apart, right? Where you can't find, so say that you have a data set where you're finding a hyperplane with you, where you got a lot of points nearby, right? Mm -hmm. um so i i totally get that you're not gonna get that many points on the margins because of the locations right but potentially you could right say that you have just like tons and tons of observations um yep. and, and the data and the two classes are, are fairly close like wouldn't you get more support vectors in that case yeah. or am i just I, like no i i think you're I think you're right. Um, it may not be that I would have to look it up. It may not be that um, you have to have, it has to be exactly, you know, uh, like kind of just exactly the closest point. Maybe it's the neighborhood of values or something like that, because like if any one of those values, you know, increase or decrease by a little bit, then it would move the, um, it would change the margin, you know, um, and, and also change, probably change the estimation of this hyperplane. Um, so I don't know, it's a good question. Right, I, right, I, right. I see what like, you mean, yeah. It's like these these here, right? You maybe even this one over here or this one uh -huh. definitely, right? Yeah. If like that point was slightly perturbed, like it, you add a little bit of random noise, it could go over uh -huh. to this margin, Yeah. you know, and, and yeah, could change the estimation of that hyperplane. So I don't, uh, yeah, it's a really good question. It, it may be just a concept rather than a technical definition of a support vector. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Um, it it almost seems like a circular type thing, right? Because you're saying you're defining it this way, but then if it changes, then it has a. It it also changes the hyperplane, and right. therefore, it, and and to me, it just seems like it, it would go around in circles. So maybe yeah, maybe it's. Yeah, I mean, it does say okay. It does say they're equidistant from the hyperplane. So this this seems this, uh, yeah, this that seems kind sense. of yeah. okay. this seems kind of strict um, in yeah. terms of it yeah. has to be exactly the same distance as the minimum distance, mm -hmm. the points are mm -hmm. the minimum distance. But um, but again, like I think one one thing I hear in what you're saying too is that um, this is a very clean and unrealistic example. <laughs> um right like yeah, yeah, like yeah, where do true, you true. where do you have 
a situation where you have no mixing in the linear boundary. You know, it's like, I feel like it's yeah. probably pretty rare. Um, so I think this is really good for getting the concept of the hyperplane and the margin um, down and trying to, what it means to maximize that margin. But then I think it's just kind of a building block rather than an actual technique you would use, you know? Uh -huh. That's at least that's, that's how I would look at look at it. Okay, yeah, um, maybe that's that's how I have to think about it. But but yeah, uh, some things yeah definitely. So a little bit unclear for me too. So, um, but we can. I'm gonna look that up after and just see what the if there's a better, clear definition of support vectors or something that's mm -hmm. a little more generalizable than just like it has to be exactly equidistant from the hyperplane. You know. Um, lie on the, the lie on the margin exactly uh, right um all right so so this is just basically putting in math what we were just talking about so you want to maximize m which is this margin um and the betas are chosen to maximize that margin um there's a constraint that i saw this in the book and i guess this means that uh, the betas squared have to add up to one. So if you added up all the coefficients from beta naught to beta p, uh, where p is the number of predictors, um, and you squared them as you added them, you know, this, the uh, squared sum, I guess, uh, you would get to, it has to be one, um, which is interesting. They didn't really talk about that, that, why that is in the book that much from what I recall. Um, but, but yeah, uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, I didn't quite get that part, I guess. Um, and then let's see, the third equation ensures that every observation will be correctly classified as long as the margin is positive. Second and third equations ensure that each data point is on the correct side of the hyperplane and is at least M distance away from the hyperplane. I'm not sure how the second equation does that. Yeah, well, anyway, um, but I think this last one makes sense, although I don't exactly know what this symbol means here. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I is just talking about the observations in the data set. You have your betas for each observation, and then it's saying that each point has to be greater than whatever the, like each prediction has to be greater than whatever the maximum maximum margin is, which which makes sense. That's just like, you know, once you've found a maximum, maximal margin, like every given a new observation, you should have a prediction that's outside of that margin. Mm -hmm. That makes um, sense. But I don't, yeah, I need to look, what did, I don't even know how to look that up with that. <laughs> um, like, it might mean like given or something like that, or some, some kind of, you know, translation of English to math. Um, given I in from one to N, maybe. Let's see. It means for all. Oh, okay. Hey, I was like kind of, kind of close. All, yeah. Okay. So for all, thank you for looking that up. <laughs> I welcome. guess it's like an upside down A, so no that, that works all. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. Is that actually a, a symbol that has a name, uh, like the, the actual symbol? Let's see. Is the it a... Yeah, explanation was very wordy. Uh, It's just the says just as the for all symbol is made up made up by math. It's like for all, but it's the for all quantifier. Yeah. It's a Unicode character. Uh, let's see. It's from predicate logic. Seems like the logic math people made yeah. it up. Yeah, it's from that logic stuff. 
Cool. Cool. Usually they're like Greek letters, so I was surprised when I saw that. I was like, I don't, I don't know yes. that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else in this slide other than the high level things we just mentioned. Um, but I think we should get into the kind of the more flexible stuff here. Um, okay, so support vector classifier starts to tackle the problem of kind of a little bit of a messier data set, right? So like when you can't cleanly separate two classes, um, you um, might also not want to, you know, drastically adjust like your line or your, your hyperplane given, you know, a new training point that violates the margin. So like, for instance, if we go back to uh, here, right? Um, like, let's say we had this line here, but then we had another kind of pink class right, right up top up here. Um, then that might shift if you wanted to completely separate everything. You might end up getting a, a, a line that goes diagonally now or, or like a little bit, you know, steeper of a line going through here. Um, and in a lot of situations, you don't want to make such a drastic kind of adjustment just given one line. And, um, and I think like when you think of a concept like that, you also think of overfitting, right? Because just like one point can really dramatically change a line if you're if you have the strict kind of conditions about um, no points um, violating that margin area, um, and also no you know value no observations of another class on the other side of the line um, or the hyperplane. So um, so in this case, right, we have. A, a little bit of a more flexible um, or softer margin um, where some training data can be in the margin or on the other side of this hyperplane, which is useful, you know, for these reasons that we're mentioning above. Um, okay. So in this case, you actually have this epsilon um, that gives you a little bit of wiggle room. Um, so in the epsilons, are basically have to add up to be less than C and C is your tuning parameter. So C is kind of like the budget of how much error or um, kind of, uh, um, you know, margin violation you can have in your training set. Um, and it's like a lot of the things we're talking about will be chosen by cross-validation. Um, and, and also, like I think, you know, it's a similar concept to what we saw in, uh, you know, lasso regression with like the the budget of the of that tuning parameter. It's I, I would say, you know, they I like it when they talk about budgets. It, like intuitively, it makes sense to me. Um, uh, you know, like you you can only you can have some violations, but depending on C, if it you can't you can't have more of a violation than you have a budget for in terms of the value of C. Um, so, you know, it, it has to be greater than or equal to this margin, but plus or minus this, um, this budget. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if you're, you know, if all the epsilons here are zero, you have no budget. Um, okay, sorry. If, if, Never mind. Um, okay, sorry, I was jumping ahead of here. So if the total budget is zero, then you basically have the same situation we have with the maximum margin classifier. But once you get to greater than zero, um, then you you can you have some flexibility. Um, okay, and then if if uh, the epsilon is zero. Um, for a given observation, then the observation is on the correct side of the margin. If it's greater than zero, um, then it's on the wrong side of the margin. Um, then if it's greater than one, it's on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So yeah, think about that for a second. So it's greater than zero, then it's on the wrong side of the margin. If it's greater than one, then it's on the wrong side of the hyperplane. 
Okay. I think that makes sense because does, does that mean the margin is always less than one? Like the space where the margin exists has to be less than one. I don't understand why that, that's true. Hmm. I'd have to, may have to look that up. Because I think what that's saying is that if you have some sort of margin, that this space has to be, think about that for a second, that space has to be less than one. Can you go back to the slide that you were on? Um, this one? Yeah, okay. So, okay, so if E1 is equal to zero, right? Observation is the correct side of the margin if it's equal to zero. Is it because the, the margin has to be positive or so if it's greater than one, if you do one minus E, that would give you a negative. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess. Don't know. Sorry. Um, Sorry, yeah, maybe no, it's just, I was just thinking out loud, but it's just maybe it's just indicating that you're moving it, it, it it's an epsilon value that makes it so that you have to move in the kind of other direction. In the other where, direction, right. Okay. Of where the margin is for this class. Um like if you start from I guess where the observed class is, uh -huh. then you have to you have to move in a negative direction to get to that point, you know? Right. right. I think that, I think that makes sense, but I don't, I just don't get why it's one minus, like why is one special, you know? Why is it one minus epsilon? Mm. Cause like C could be any, you know, uh, C could be any value uh, that you choose in this cross validation process and I just don't, yeah, I don't, it's okay. so e, e, epsilon, epsilon has to be greater than or equal to zero, and then all the epsilons have to add up to C, which makes sense. I, yeah, I just don't get why one, this one uh -huh. minus stuff is, is there, but, um, because M kind of seems like a function here, and I guess maybe there's some things happening with M that they don't really go into. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't right. really get that part. Right. Yeah. But maybe this is what you're talking about, this chapter, you know, it's a little bit, some of these details are a little hard to parse out, uh, you know, the if you try to go a little bit deeper than what they're showing here. Like, I, I don't know if they actually do have an explanation for this part, but maybe we could look back at the text. Um, but at a high level, like this makes yeah, sense huh. to me that we're like, that we're giving ourselves come some kind of error budget. Um, Mm -hmm. for for points that violate the margin and then you kind of are more or less tolerant depending on how big that error budget is how big c is um but yeah I, yeah this is going to bother me but i don't i don't quite get that that one minus setup is, okay and, and this is just very <laughs> ignorant but is it related to where the the squared distances have to be you say it again, you kind of broke up. Sorry. Is it related to this second condition subject to the sum of the squared distances for the predictors being equal to one? Hmm. Maybe. Isn't that how you obtain the margins, right? It's perpendicular distance to the points closest to what, so whatever those support vectors are. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Sorry, maybe this is just more confusing. <laughs> Keep going, Kevin. No. no, I mean, I see what you're saying. I, yeah, but like these observed values in each predictor could take on any value. So even though the the betas squared have to add up to one, right. Couldn't this whole thing, this whole thing could be way greater than one. That's true. That's true. And, and in I, fact, you would expect some of them, right? And could it be less than, I, could it, maybe it can't be less than one? I don't know. Well, no, it, it has to be, 
they have to have the ability to go on either side of the boundary, right? So like, right. Uh, like if it, remember in the simpler example, if it was positive, greater than equals a positive one, or no, mm -hmm. if it's greater than or equals to zero, you it's going to be a, a the one category. If it's less than zero, a negative the negative one category. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. This it's yeah. these are all jumbled right now in my head. Um, yeah, let's let's come back to this. See if we can figure it out as we talk through maybe. But if not, we can go okay. through the book. Um, okay. All right, so they're just showing a visual illustration here. Um, okay, so um, of this of this uh, support vector classifier. Um, so in the top left uh, panel, the largest value of C was chosen. Um, so so in this case, you have a huge budget for um, uh, error. Um, of in terms of uh, points being uh, violating your margin. And so not only are there points inside the margin here, but there's points of the wrong class inside the margin as well. Um, if this is your kind of hyperplane here. Um, so this is the most liberal uh, C in this case uh, for this example. And I think as you go from left to right, top to bottom, you're going to get uh, to be a more in a more stringent scenario. Um, so in this last one, uh, I think this should be the most stringent C. Um, so you have less of a budget for both margin violations as well as uh, the wrong class, which is just another kind of margin violation, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, you have one point here that's a, uh, on in the wrong class, you know, on the wrong side of the boundary. You have one here that's on the boundary, one here that's in the margin, and two here that are in the margin, and then you have a few that are on the boundary. Oh, in the wrong class over here. But but yeah, it, it has the le least amount of um, violation as you kind of go through this this left to right, top to bottom, um, and that's all just based on the budget of C, the value of C. Um, and they're saying again, just like what the maximum margin classifier, the property of the classifier is that only data points which lie on or violate the margin will affect the hyperplane. And these points on our support vector. So this sounds like it compared to the maximum margin classifier, which has no tolerance for margin violations. In this case, the support vectors are anything that actually violate the margin or on or on the line of the margin. So that's interesting. I didn't see that when I read the book. Um, but maybe that answer is part of our question from before, right? That um, this is a kind of a broader inclusion of what it means to be a support vector, right? It's 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 anything that's going to push this hyperplane, um, and it only cares about you know in the formulation of where this hyperplane is. It's only going to react to points that are within. Um, or on the, the margin. Um, okay, um, let's get into support vector machines. Um, so support ve vector machines start to get into the scenario where you want even more flexibility. So you don't want not only do you want some flexibility in terms of the actual boundary line, you know, in terms of these margin violations that we just talked about, but um, you also want some, uh, you know, more flexibility in terms of how you draw that, that boundary. Um, so uh, mainly we're talking about nonlinear boundaries and um, kind of a, a lot of different, you know, either um, kind of a curved line or even a, a circle around, um, uh, or any kind of shape really around around a, a set of points. Um, and that's what support vector machines get us. So kind of we're constantly, as we go through this chapter, expanding our flexibility and our capability in terms of the types of patterns we can pick up on and the types of data sets, you know, a little messier, a little bit more mixed in terms of the classes. 
Um, yeah, and they talk about like, so you could achieve this kind of effect with a nonlinear boundary um, by if you started including higher degree polynomials in that hyperplane, you know, uh, definition, you know, that hyperplane equation. But their point is that this um, uh, this kind of gets pretty complicated. Uh, uh, I don't know. I guess you just have to trust them on that. <laughs> that this is a, a more computationally efficient approach to support vector machines than defining your hyperplane with all these higher degree polynomials and interaction and interaction terms. Um, all right, so this gets into the good stuff here. Um, so we want a nonlinear decision boundary. Um, and the way that uh, uh, you know the, the these calculations are done in terms of what um, I guess how it makes these these boundaries um, is that it uses the inner products um, of all the observations. So basically, I think for every observation, it's going to go um, through. Question yeah. <laughs> before yeah. before yeah. I just yeah. forget. So go um, ahead. Yeah. Um, generally, if one wants to use this SBM. You mm -hmm. just don't need to go to use um support vector classifier or um you just go to support vector machine because it's generalized. It can take care of other things. Um, yeah. I just want to, um, is, is that correct? I think that's right. Yeah. So like, okay. I think you can you can imitate the behavior of a maximum margin classifier or a support mm -hmm. vector classifier. Yes. By by the different tuning parameters, okay. I think it's Ford vector machine, but um, but yeah, I think that's right. That's my interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um. Okay. So in the SVM context, um, um, they use these dot products of each. So for every observation you do this dot product, which is just basically um, summing up uh, each. So like if you consider the first row and the second row for each predictor, you're multiplying the first and second row's value for that predictor. And then you're adding up all those multiplied values across every column for those two observations. And you're going to do that for, um, for every um, uh, pair of points in your training set. Um, and then you end up with um, uh, this function here. Um, so you have the sum of all these, uh, basically every pair of points dot product um, times, uh, what is this, gamma? Is that gamma? Um, times gamma. Um, I'm just going to call it gamma, unless it corrects me. Um, and that looks uh, like alpha. alpha. Okay. Okay. Sounds right. I just, I always forget which one's which. Um, <laughs> um, okay. And then it's saying, and then so for every single point, um, you're going to have a different value here. Um, now let me just see if we can get to. This is where it got a little bit fuzzy for me, exact, exactly what we're estimating. Um, okay. In order to compute f of x for new point x, we need an inner product. Okay. Um, points that are not support vectors, we can rewrite the equation as follows. Okay, so this, I guess, this value here this is going to be zero if the val if the point um, that you're doing the dot product of is not in the margin. I think that's what it's saying here. So so basically, you you only sounds like you only have to do this for the points that are in the margin. So that our element of s for s is the support vector indices. And then let's see. And 
And then if you start um, kind of taking this and uh, taking it to different powers, you get, you can obtain like, I guess, different shapes or different kernel shapes. Um, and there's a lot of different, I guess, functions you can you can have here. Uh, one in the book, they had the exponential, like a exp, a, a exp function um, that kind of contained all of this here. And, and basically you can use these different powers, these different, you know, um, uh, ways to define the kernel to get different shapes that can form your decision line. Um, Yeah, um, but here, I guess what's missing for me is like, what is it optimizing for? Um, so I can I can hang with this dot product thing, um, but like what it, you're choosing betas, I guess, I guess probably based on a similar idea of maximum margin, right? Um, I would think. But, um, that would make yeah, sense to me. What yeah. I'm getting lost here is what does the inner product tell you? Um, so yeah. it says solution to the SVC problem is in the SVM context involves only the inner products, right? Of the observations. So mm -hmm. like why? Um, inner yeah. products of the... Yeah, I don't um, understand. Yeah, so... Um, I think it's confusing for me too. I okay, okay. I um, so I think it's actually they actually mentioned this in the book. It's very similar to how you calculate correlation. Um, oh, okay. Correlation, um, Pearson, like if you look at Pearson correlation formula, um, um. So here you're, I guess you're multiplying distances from the mean, but um, looks kind of similar. So I guess like, I just think, let's just talk through what this would do. So like, as you move, if these points are moving together, this is gonna be large and positive. If they're moving in the opposite direction, it's gonna be large and negative and they don't move very much it'll be small and positive or negative right um like if you think about oh, I'm just okay to, okay i'm just trying to think about like what the what it's telling you um Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how you arrive at that exact formulation, like why, you know, like what it's derived from, I guess. Um, that's what I'm missing. Um, but yeah, I, it's it's a it's a good question. I, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, okay. So I, I guess- I was just the, looking- Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just looking in the book and yes, you are correct in that later on. So they go through this whole derivation and then the linear kernel, right? Once you're at the kernel stage, essentially quantifies the similarity of a pair of observations using Pearson standard correlation. So yes, I think that you're computing these dot products for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that yeah. actually helps. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know how much sure. how much I explained, but yeah. But it, but I'm just trying to still think through like what is this function kernel mm -hmm. function telling you? And then I guess it's saying so. You're going to only consider the points that are in the margin, within the margin, or on the margin boundary, and you're going to compute all the dot products. And then you're gonna say, how similar are these points to each other? And then you're gonna end up with some um, alpha, you said that was an alpha, right? Alpha that weighs, weight, weighs each 
each dot dot product or or result from this kernel function mm -hmm. somehow. Um, So I guess if you have points that are more similar to each other within the margin, uh, I don't know, they would get uh, higher weight. I don't know, I have to think through what that mm -hmm. means. Let's, let's go through the next slides mm -hmm. and maybe see if it helps. Okay. Um, um, okay, and they're just saying there's other kernels you can use. So the, like I was saying, this exponent, exponential function um, where it exponentiates this this value. Um, this is actually different here, right? So this is actually a difference, a squared difference between two observations. Um, for given observations, test observations, if, if it's far from x i, then k will be small given the negative and large in here, right? It'll play a little role in f of x uh, star. I see, so, so, okay, maybe the big idea here is that like, these are different ways of, um, kind of quantifying how much, oh man, like how much an observation is gonna, predicted class is based on the sign of f of x. So the training observations far from a given test point play a little part in determining the label. So I guess it's just saying like how far are points from, from, the margin, points in the margin. And if they're close, if they're similar, then then they're gonna they're gonna be given a high weight in determining what that boundary is. Is that right? Sam, that you have your... logically makes sense, yes. Yeah, and then the, each of these are kind of different ways of getting there, either with the dot product, the squared sum, expon exponentiated squared sum. Um, I have a question. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so in practically, if we want to do this stuff about vector machine, mm -hmm. um. We can, I know in Python, you can specify like um, the kernel, you want to use linear, you want to use radial. I think there are many other kernel um, one can use. So um, what does that really makes a difference using the radial here and the linear kernels? What makes them different? Um, is it the way they find, do the calculation and other stuff? Um, yeah, I'm not clear about that. I think radial is like a, like a, ends up being like a, a circular boundary, I think, like this. Okay. Uh, so I think it's just the shape of the, okay, just the, as different shapes of the boundary. Yeah. Uh, so the linear one, if your data maybe is linear, then the linear kernel may work, but if mm -hmm. it's not linear, maybe the radial may work better, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Thank like you. here, yeah, sure. Um, so here, here, I think they're showing that you can use both. Um, this is a polynomial. So it's a kind of like a curve boundary. Um, and this is the same data set, but, um, but yeah, uh, it seems like maybe the radial one works better here because it more cleanly exactly. okay. kind of defines the space, you know, mm -hmm. um, but. Okay, well, let's just get to the last one here. Um, so this is the, and then we can talk. Um, so like, then we got in the case of like, what do you do when you have more than one class? And there's a few, two approaches they talk about. So there's one versus one approach. 
um, where you basically you construct k choose two SVMs where k is the number of classes. So um, um, so you say like I guess you have a classifier for each cl level or each class, and then um, for every point you would fit like um, each you use apply each classifier for each class. Um, and uh, or I think in this case, it's like, it's, oh, sorry, it's one class against another class. And you have a classifier for every combination of classes in your data set. Um, and then the one that is, has like kind of the strongest prediction, um, I guess the one I, would th I think that's like furthest from the margin um, will, be the class that's chosen. Um, and then there's another option where you construct classifiers where you just have a classifier for every level or every different class in your data set. And, you, and it's just, is it this class versus any other class? Um, so that's one versus all, um, which is also another way of doing it. And then I think in this case, let's see. Um, forget how this one works in terms of the output. Uh, I guess it's just, I think they're kind of both about strength, but I forget how this one is calculated. So guys, he signed test observation in class K for which this is the largest. Yeah, so which for which the kind of prediction is the largest, um, which I think is essentially like, you know, you want one that's going to be far, it's going to be far away from that decision boundary. So you're kind of more confident that it's, um, it belongs to that class. Whew, there's a lot to, a lot to go through. Um, all right. Uh, is there anything we want to like look over quickly? Um, and we're kind of at the hour, top of the hour. Um, I am really curious about that, this minus one thing, um, but I don't know if they'll have a good explanation in the book or it'd be easy to find. Where is it? Here. Um, I don't know. The way I feel about this chapter is like, I, I get the concepts of what it's doing better than I did before. Um, and I, I, I think I might need to review a little bit of the maybe linear algebra of the, the stop product stuff to really understand why that's the formulation for these kernels. Um, but it's interesting because like, it doesn't seem like all kernels use dot products. Like these radial kernels don't. Um, these are square differences. And, and I, and the other thing that I need to kind of clarify mm -hmm. a little more is that, um, for myself is that they said this a few times that the advantage of using a kernel rather than simply a large feature space, since it is only necessarily, it's necessary to compute and choose two kernel functions. I don't really get. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I really enjoyed the session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I, I feel like it, I kind of hobbled through a lot of it, but I, I think yeah, I, I I enjoyed it too. I just um, it's a yeah. lot of a lot of I think a lot of details are a little bit hidden from from us in this chapter, like you were saying at the beginning, Sandra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like, think, I, um, okay. I'm, I'm trying to understand, right? Like, um, like you mentioned the math as to why, um, you know, you have linear curve. I, I guess it's just that. So if you look at the radial kernels, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's slide 912. And you have uh, your kernel function and then applied to x and x1. So then this exponent, uh, whatever term, right? Which then is... Mm -hmm differences or sum of square differences, right? Defines like uh, a circle, right? So in a sense you're putting, 
sorry, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I think I'm just trying to see like what exactly it is that makes this, so that makes the decision boundary uh, circular. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just the equation of the kernel function. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, but I can say that though. What I'm also confused about is is it, it talks about like you only compute these. You only need to compute these. Um, where is it? See you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, champ. Champ. Yeah. You only need to compute these for the set of points that are in the margin. But how do you know what points are in mm -hmm. the margin before you've estimated, you know, before you've <laughs> run everything through this, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't, I don't really just, I don't really get where, where are the betas? Like, what are you, where are your weights? What are you, what are you training? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what, like, like in the other examples, it was clear, like, you had a set of, linear weights and, um, mm -hmm. and you're trying to maximize the margin, the distance from the margin. Yeah. I get that's, that's crystal yeah. clear to me, and, but like here, like what is the, this is being calculated fine, but like, what do you do with this? <laughs> like, where does it like, like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you, yeah, 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 yeah. I think this is just a tuning parameter here. So like, um, yeah. Wait, this one? Sorry. This, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this gamma? I don't know. Uh, but maybe we need to connect. I think that's a lambda, rest. but I could lambda. be wrong. Okay. So we need to, I think we need to connect it to the rest of the chapter. Like maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that whole thing, right, is the same as this somehow. And that still like this. I don't know, but even here though, you have betas that you're tu estimating tuning to maximize the margin. But like, is that still true with kernels? Is just somehow this gets plugged in somewhere in the, that picture, in this picture. Um, mm -hmm. That part is just, the connection between those two isn't that clear to me. Um, you still have these things like a, okay. you know, I, I a margin right. violation. Right. Bound like margin violation budget, like a C still in play here. Oh, I see. I see. I wonder if it's um, sorry, and this is probably like somewhat naive of me, but you know how when you um, at the very beginning on the maximal margin classifier, right, you're looking for the plane that minimizes some or maximizes some distance, right. And so for the radial kernel, I assume that it must be going through similar iterations, right? Until it finds something that does that? Or am I like totally mistaken? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. But like, that's that's what I think too. But the okay. what I don't get is like, what are you tuning to maximize that thing? Like- Oh, yeah. That like there's no, there's no like beta, beta, betas here, right? So like, like wait, like what is, what is the? Oh, I see. Yeah. Like so, let's yeah, say you have a loss, yeah, yeah. like a loss, a loss function yeah. that is like the, yeah, a loss function that's like the, um, you know, the distance from the margin, and you want to maximize that distance, mm -hmm. and then you kind of explore the feature space, the space of those coefficients to get closer and closer to that maximal value. But like, what is? Like what mm -hmm. is being iterated on or tuned? Like this just seems like a calculation. Like mm -hmm. just for our observed values, you just get some, you know, kernel value. But like how? Back to this for a second. Maybe yeah, there's something we missed. Maybe yeah. Maybe there's. Uh... Kernel is a function that quantifies the similarity of two data points. We got that. We want to enlarge the feature space to make use of the nonlinear decision. Oh, I see. So, so I think. Um, hold on. Let me just figure that out for a second. 
So maybe this kind of replaces the raw data in a sense. Uh, hmm. So we only need to estimate these gam, these, this, this, and beta naught. Maybe it's just saying that for radial kernels, this function here is just this radial function. Um, and that you are still mm -hmm, estimating mm -hmm, beta naught mm -hmm. and these, what do we say those were, alpha? Alphas, yeah. No, it says replace hmm. every inner product with so K is kernel, kernel function. So I think they're just saying like, you're always going to be estimating this and this alpha, but then this inner product thing is going to be different depending on what your kernel function is. Okay, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. huh. And that you're still doing some kind of maximum margin thing in terms of what you choose is your beta not in your alpha. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that that so what is lambda again in the radial kernel? Just a constant that does what? I think it's a constant. It, it a um, sort of constant. Okay. Yeah. Um so I guess like huh. So I mean, one thing it does, right? It's it's as I was saying down here is that if a point is really far from a train test point is really far from a training point that mm -hmm. was in the margin, or is a support as part of the support vector points, then it it kind of downloads it because it's now it's a negative exponentiated value, so it's really small. So this like oh okay okay huh. but like I don't I don't know I guess it's just controlling how much it downweights or upweights certain you know values but it's just like a scalar i think um okay okay i don't know i guess i think you would just tune that uh in a cross validation as well mm -hmm. oh yeah it says it's a positive constant um yeah right. i don't know uh, but it's just like I guess, yeah controlling how much how much uh yeah how much how much uh weight a given just point two points with a given distance get um yeah oh okay 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 i think i think i'm getting it <laughs> sorry for the very basic questions but but i think now i get okay. the n n choose two thing because it's literally because it's just you basically like instead of having to estimate these things for every single point you you just have to estimate it for uh -huh. all pairs of points, which is I guess n choose two. I don't know. Uh, that's the best I can do. Uh, yeah, but okay. So, but if you're estimating for every pair of points, but that would be more than n, right? That uh, yeah, that would be more. Yeah, because yeah. No, well. Or at least the same, right? Well, if you have so every four, point to every other point. If you have four points and you want to get all pairs, right? You're gonna have one uh -huh. and two, one and three, one and four, two and uh -huh. two and two and three. So what is let's see, four choose two, six. Yeah, it's more. It's gonna be more. So you're going to get more similarity scores than there are points, but somehow that's still more computationally mm -hmm. feasible mm -hmm. than fitting some complex polynomial um, for the hyperplane equation. I see. I see. And that's where okay. my my understanding stops. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I thought, mine stopped I, a while back yeah right? i i just don't really get why how you can say like what's in the like what's in the support space if you don't know what your betas are in 
Gant, Alphazar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Like animation or something. Some kind of uh, yes. another yes. another source. I need to read some read a little more about it to really understand it. But I think this chapter is helpful. I just um, it's a lot of brushed over math, and um, it's hard to kind of answer some of the questions that we're struggling with. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was. Uh kind of grateful that they uh, looked over the math but now that we've actually gotten a little bit into it now i'm like okay it's actually more confusing that they're not explaining it um, yeah yeah but i think yeah. what they presented oh, here makes the the math that they've presented makes sense but i'm just not sure how the mechanism of estimation works you know? mm. like like i want like a one step one two three four like how they did for uh the different decision tree uh yeah yeah methods i thought that was really useful in terms of like what the algorithm is um right right i would love to see like what is the algorithm for this you know and maybe we just mm -hmm. need to google that did they overall say um what these were useful for, like in what types of scenarios, like better than say some of the other things that we've looked at for classification? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a theme at the end, they have that section at the end about um about similarity to logistic regression um, mm -hmm. and how I think like if you had well separated classes, I think would be better if there was I think something like that. Hold on, let me. Uh, okay. Let me just go back. I have the book in front of me. Um, I know at the end, like it was like the last paragraph here. Um, so it says here. Uh, where is it? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, so it says when the classes are well separated, SVMs tend to behave better than logistic regression. More overlapping regimes, logistic regression is often preferred. Preferred. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. But I, I think like in a lot of these cases, if you really just care about performance, you would probably Throw in an SVM, throw in like a, a classification, you know, uh, random forest or something. Like you would, you would probably compare a bunch of these tech approaches um, and see which ones went out. But, um, but I, they didn't really get into comparisons beyond just logistic regression. Right. Okay. That actually but, helps. But that, but that was more about like it's a very similar mathematical form, mm -hmm. the logistic regression. Um, so that was kind of there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. They also talk about support vector regression, See where it seeks coefficients that minimize a different kind of loss where only residuals larger than an absolute value an absolute value of some positive constant contributes to the loss function. So I think it's the margin using support vector classifiers. Yeah, I mean, I don't... It's interesting. I don't really think we've seen too many methods in this book where, like, within a certain boundary, your, you know, these points are, are going to uh, change the estimation of your, like, you know, how, you, how you determine, you know, how you do your classification and then outside of that boundary they have no influence at all you know like that's a really strange or unique kind of you know approach. like i i don't think there are too many other techniques or any other ones really um 
like maybe the decision trees in some way are kind of like that but yeah or maybe in the way for example if you're doing k nearest neighbors or something right and you set the number of neighbors um if you make it very local then i'm assuming distant neighbors have no bearing on what the decision mm -hmm. boundary looks locally right maybe i i don't know yeah yeah i'd have to dust off that that knowledge again but yeah feels but like it was forever again, it ago be so. different yeah like uh I don't know, yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. And thanks for staying thanks. Uh, and answering questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for the discussion. I, I, was, uh, I definitely learned, you know, clarified some things that I was confused about through our discussion. Um, but I really do want to look at some other resources and just see we can connect a little bit better. I can connect a little better some of my misunderstandings about like the, the connection between the kernel and the actual betas and like the weights that you're estimating, you know? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and like how- Can I ask you a slight off topic question? Yeah, go, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You know of a good R package uh, to make Venn diagrams? Hmm. I've never done it's that totally in our head. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I know there's some stuff for diagramming that I saw listed in Cordo. Um, uh, just like these are just tools that are integrated mm. to Cordo. Um, Maybe I um, should look into Cordo. Like they have like Mermaid. Um, Mermaid is something that's integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, maybe they, maybe Mermaid can do, it can do a lot of different things. Maybe Mermaid can do. I mean, it can do a lot of different kinds of diagrams. Mm -hmm. um, mermaid. But they seem like mostly like flow charts. I'm not, oh, here we go. Some yes. Oh, oh wait. Venn diagram syntax, December 22nd, 2021. Emerge the huh, Okay. Let's see. Unions and sections. Plus one, plus one. There, since they hold in this. Okay, I will check that out then. So, Porto Mermaid. Yeah. Um, let's see, this is what this tweet is saying here. Graph is. Yeah, I mean, from that, I don't see a lot in their documentation, but um, Mermaid JS. Um, state diagram, user journey, pie chart. Let's see, API. I just want like a full reference. Can I like search this website? Oh, up here. They're not clickable. Like from that you may be able to do it but I, it's just really hard to i will look into it um i have one but i just wanted more options so it's not like yeah. super crucial just if you knew it off the top of your head had you done venn diagrams okay yeah no i haven't yeah. 
No, no problem. All righty. So next week we'll just do uh, bring your own questions like we usually do. I think so. I yeah. I think it would be good to go through some okay. examples for this this stuff and maybe yeah we'll learn we'll have some of what we're talking about for in terms of estimation clarify a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think the lab will be useful. I'm um, sort of tagging along with someone that's doing uh, using support vector machines to classify like uh, it's uh, resting state functional MRI things. And so it's helpful for me to understand why he picked this specific technique. And I think now it makes sense because um, so they had uh, an aging cohort. So, you know, you have young and then middle-aged and then age brains, but the large comparison there is between the young and old. And so I think mm -hmm. that those are fairly separable classes. So it makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, to use maybe this, this type of SVM. But then I can also now ask, you know, like how he said, you know, like either what kernels, what the decision boundary is looking like mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that I'm more informed. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. So we very timely, project. this chapter. Yeah, that's huh? great. Um, it's great that cool that you have a project around it. So. Yeah, I kind of just uh, awesome. asked if, you know, I can tag along and bother people. And because uh, I want to practice on like, not just lab things or, you know, like book, textbook examples, but actual like real data. Cause there's often so much more to like um, troubleshoot there than, and, and no answers really, other than, you know, the ones that you figure out through trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All righty, uh, I shall see you next week then. Thanks for the... Yep for the presentation today. Sounds good, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the discussion, I'll talk to you next week. All right, bye. Bye.